I think, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so that yesterday, Sally, I got the word. So before I introduce Marie, I just want to recognize that the funding has come from Create for STEM Institute, and it's important to uh, thank them for that so that we were able to have our final speaker in this series this year come and join us from Sweden. So I'm happy to have an opportunity to introduce Dr. Maria Johansson from the Lulio Institute of Technology in Lulio, Sweden, and she's got a map, she'll show you where that is in a couple minutes. <laughs> So I met Maria a few years ago in Berlin at a Mathematics Education and Society conference and then last year and the year before I was able to spend some time with her when I visited Sweden to give some talks at different conferences. Maria's first PhD is actually in mathematics and she studied real analysis with a focus on Hardy's inequality. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> <laughs> so, <I'm just> <laughs> she's, so she's published work related to this area of research in places like Journal of Inequalities in Pure and Applied Mathematics and the Eurasian Mathematical Journal and has presented work at the um, Australian Mathematics Society related to her mathematics research. But this past March, she earned a second PhD in math education. And her early research actually focused on the gymnasium level of mathematics, which is their college preparatory. But more recently, she became really intrigued with studying preschool math. So when I was in Sweden for her dissertation defense, I learned this very interesting story about how she sort of wandered into preschool mathematics. So she was at a major conference in Sweden and happened into a room that she thought was gonna be a talk about collegiate level mathematics teaching and learning, only to find that it was about preschool mathematics, but she knew the presenters, so she didn't feel comfortable leaving the room. <laughs> so she stayed in the presentation, and at the end of the presentation, she approached the speakers and they had raised a bunch of questions about preschool mathematics in Sweden. And she approached the speakers and said, I'm teaching courses like you're talking about and I have all kinds of data and was really excited about talking more about preschool mathematics. So that's sort of how she ended up um, becoming really intrigued with this idea of looking at what kinds of things um, happens both in how, we, how they prepare teachers and people to work with preschool children, but also how um, children in preschools engage with mathematics. So that kind of um, work has led to disseminations at conferences like MADIF, which is a major conference in Sweden, the Nordic Conference on Math Education, Math Ed Society, and they had a very recent piece published in Research in Math Education. So as you'll probably see from the talk, Maria has argued that previously preschool has been a precursor to school mathematics, but looking at the preschool and the school mathematics with the same glasses does not work. Trying to think of preschool math as pre-algebra or pre-geometry is not appropriate. The parts of mathematics that she herself has appreciated as a mathematician, especially the creativity it takes, she thinks has completely disappeared in school mathematics, but it's very present in preschool mathematics. So if you would join me in welcoming Dr. Richard. Thank you very much for that introduction, Beth. And I also want to give my thanks to the Creative STEM Institute for inviting me. Uh, as Beth gave a short background, I will also try to give a short background, but with another small few things. But first of all, I want to show where I am actually from. Lulu University of Technology is in the northern part of Sweden. This is a map. And I tried to put out the hill. You can see it's in the very northern part of Sweden. So I'm very, 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 very glad to come here and it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually my first time without having long trousers on. So it's really great for this season. Uh, I will begin by giving you just a short introduction. Uh, Beth already told you I have a double PhD, one in mathematics and one in mathematics education. Uh, between these two, or during these two studies, I've been teaching in different areas, starting off with mathematical courses, uh, masters in mathematics, different engineering programs, after a couple of years, my professors realized that I actually also had uh, a mathematics teacher degree. 
So I started teaching uh, in the mathematics teacher, teacher programs, uh, focusing on preschool teachers and grade one to six. This is kind of where my story starts. Uh, like Beth told you, I was very much intrigued with the literature I read, talking about pre-algebra, pre-geometry, thinking about where where does this fit? I, I know mathematics, but what is the pre, what comes before mathematics? How can we, what is that? Uh, so that's the background. Uh, today I'm going to give a talk about the research I've done focusing on preschool. Uh, just to give you a short background, the Swedish preschool uh, has age, uh, children age one to five. So we don't have like kindergarten and then a preschool. Uh, children at age six attend what we call in Sweden a preschool class, that's preparation for school. Uh, if you look at it, the age group of three, four year olds, over 90% attend preschool. So this is a huge uh, group. The preschool are not set up in like age groups, so we don't have classes or groups with age children age one and children age two. We have the range of children from one to five in the same group. In Sweden, we also have a national curriculum for preschool. I'm going to get into that and look at, get you to look at the goals. But the main point with this book is actually to think about the mathematics. So the first question I want to pose is, what is early mathematics? That will lead us on to what is mathematics? Is this mathematics? Are these kids engaged with some mathematics? Or are they just playing? The curriculum for preschool uh, has some goals, but not goals for the children to reach, but for the preschool to strive to ensure that they actually have the possibility of developing this. I want you to have a look at, just read it through. I will give you like a minute, I don't want to read it through for you. other skills which different ways of putting the ability, mathematical abilities, presenting them. Uh, when, when the preschool teacher get this, they, they get the feeling, many of them, that this is something they can't do. They feel that this is actually more school mathematics. And this means we have a high requirement on, on the teachers. In Sweden, the preschool teachers have a university degree, three years at the university. So, uh, I'm just to try to unpack this curriculum a bit for you, I'm going to focus on uh, numbers, number concepts. I'm to, I have tried to unpack it, and this is the way I do when I teach about it. I unpack the curriculum. So that's my starting point. So, just to show you, this is just the number concepts. The preschool child sh should strive to ensure that each child develops their understanding of the basic properties of number concepts, develop their ability to distinguish number concepts, develop their ability to express number concepts, develop their ability to examine number concepts, and develop their ability to use number concepts and their interrelationship. So this is kind of, take a look at uh, distinguish. 
Okay, some distinguished number and number concepts to examine. What does that mean? How can we, in a preschool, really examine number concepts? Yeah. My feeling when reading this was, oh, this is actually high-level mathematics. And this is what we want the preschool teachers to get. So actually, we have a high level of what we want the preschool teachers to do. Taking you back to this talk about pre-algebra, pre-geometry, uh, I, like Beth was cycling, I think, my thesis. <laughs> I don't think it's appropriate to use that kind of, and I don't think it's appropriate to put on the school mathematics. So for me, a starting point was Bishop Six mathematical activities. And this is not only a starting point for me and our research group, but actually it's the background to the revised curriculum that came out in 2010. So we have this in Sweden, trying to really unpack the mathematics, to frame it in a way the teacher can actually work with it. I'm gonna guide you through the six mathematical activities, since I'm not really sure how familiar you are with them. This is Bishop's definition of them. Uh, we are playing, explaining, locating, designing, measuring, and counting. For me, the order of them is not, here it's not the same as Bishop has presented them. Uh, I, I have decided to order them like this, and we do it most of the time when we work with them. Uh, playing and, and explaining is connected to the processes, the work with abilities, whilst locating, designing, measuring, and counting is about the content more. These activities, the first thing we did uh, when starting to use, I mean, I've been using them in professional development courses as a way of training mathematics. The first thing we did in the research group was to actually go out in preschools and video uh, to see, can we actually see all these activities in a regular day in a preschool? Uh, so I'm gonna guide you through what we saw. The, the text up there is the definition. This is two of the activities uh, that we saw in the preschool. Uh, the one to the right is a classic Swedish board game called Pitya. Uh, the one to the left is uh, children playing uh, a princess uh, play. Uh, imaginative uh, and the boy who's standing in the corner I'm not sure if you can see is adding on a plane to this building a plane into this plane uh, we, we found it very useful to actually connect it to uh, what the national curriculum was saying about this as well and this is connected to develop their ability to use mathematics to investigate, reflect over, and test different solutions to problems raised by themselves and others. We're going to come back to playing because I think that's the hardest one of Bishop's activities. The hardest one to grasp, both for us as a researcher, but also for the teacher. But I think it's the easiest one to grasp for the children. The second one is 
explaining. Finding ways to account for the existence of phenomena by the religious element, animistic or scientific. Uh, in this two situations, the one to the right, uh, the kids have gathered uh, some uh, ice from water puddle uh, and gathered them. So they have a discussion about or I talk about it being cold, they don't want to hold on to it, they want to put it down. In another situation, yeah. they're dividing an apple, and the girl who has the, she doesn't call it right in this picture, but she has the knife, she's dividing this apple into tiny pieces. So they have a talk about, okay, so my half of the apple is in tiny, tiny, tiny pieces. Is that the same amount as the one that's in three pieces? I think this is also an important uh, point to make. As you can see from this, it's not really uh, explaining or reasoning about a mathematical content, but rather explaining as such. Locating, the third one. Uh, in Sweden, there's been a discussion about whether or not locating belongs to mathematics or has to fit somewhere else. Uh, we're many of us that are very happy that actually that came into the national curriculum because it's important for further mathematical work. The two situations presented here is this boy driving uh, a van on in a sand pit, uh, exploring how to get around all these different things his friends have created. You know, they built all this, and he's trying to get his van not to run over anything. The other one is a map. Wilma has drawn a map showing how to get from her room today this room. So you can see, it's in Swedish, but <laughs> the name here, this is her dad's working office. Here you start, and this is Olivia's room, dad's working office, and this is the bedroom, and then you get to Alvin's room. And this is also in the national curriculum. Develop their understanding of space, location, and direction. So not just only space, but also location and direction. The fourth one, designing. Uh, here it's interesting to notice that designing is not just about making things. It's about also getting and mental image of what you want to make or symbolizing it. This boy is playing a game on an iPad, which means matching. He gets a picture of one doll and then he needs he has to get the same kind of doll with the same hair, the same sweater, the same matching. And then we have the shapes which, at least in Swedish preschool, would be the main things the teachers are working on when it comes to designing. It's shapes, um, maybe not all these kinds of shapes, but it's the normal, the triangle, the rectangle, the square, and the circle. And mostly the triangle looks like this. So we have that in Sweden as well. Measuring has to do with uh, measuring all different kinds of way. Um, to the right, you have a situation where the kid is actually measuring their own height using tires. And to the left, this boy is filling his bucket with sand, but realized it's too heavy to flip over to make this. Uh, so he, he has a, a with his teacher who's sitting, you can see her legs, 
about how much you want to take out before you can flip it. And from the curriculum, it says they should develop their understanding of the basic properties of quantity, also for measure, time, and change. The last one. The, more, the most common one, I would say. If you ask a preschool teacher, um, research has shown in Sweden at least that preschool teachers, if you ask what they work with in mathematics, they mention counting. Uh, and in counting, it's mostly uh, the, num the, the words of the numbers connected to uh, the numbers of things. Not that much the figure or the symbol of the number. So this is a way to get you to into where I'm at. This is the way I have framed the mathematics uh, that, a, that the preschool have been working with. And this is also the framework for my research. I blame this awareness of mathematics because that was a starting point. The data Beth mentioned, I told this, made the presentation that I had, uh, was from a professional development course. Uh, this professional development course worked for both preschool teachers and childcare staff. In Swedish preschools, we have both these groups working uh, with the children, with the preschool teacher having a pedagogical responsibility. My, whilst the childcare staff have a more caring responsibility. Uh, I had this course for, I think, four years, met around 200 preschool teacher and childcare staff. At the end of the course, they were to write a short essay based on a couple of questions I gave them. Uh, I think it was a year after the last course has ended, I, I sent a letter asking if I could use this uh, written things to, in my research. So I collected all of this and looked at what kind of stories the preschool teacher presented in this, and tried her stuff in this work. This text is one, an example of such a story that could come up. I want to show you it before I show you the question, so that you get, get a feeling of what kind of stories uh, they were giving. Uh, I was surprised at how many stories there were in this. They wrote about four to six pages, so it wasn't a long one, but still you could get kind of long stories, and they used it to argue for something. The question I posted was, what have you learned about yourself, the children, and your practice? What knowledge have you developed in and about mathematics? Describe how you relate this knowledge to how children learn and use mathematics. So I've collected all these stories, and then tried to put them into these categories, namely Bishop's Six Mathematical Activities, to see, is it still true that most of them talk about counting, and is there a difference between the preschool teacher and the shakta staff? So this is the findings, I would say. We can see, see that the shakta staff still have a huge number of counting stories. Uh, what, what surprised me was that uh, some of the stories were actually counted as different to different <coughs> activities because they had, it's not easy to separate and say this is just counting, this is just measuring. Mm -hmm. uh, they integrate. The child care stuff could have a long story about, for example, measuring, and then they up with, end up with something, and then we count it. So they kind of added counting as being the, the way of justifying that this was actually mathematics. The preschool teacher has actually gone from counting to doing more about measuring. Uh, the striking there was that they 
the focus on their measuring stories was about measuring length. That was more than 90% of the stories were about measuring length. So this was the starting point. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on in the rest of my talk is the play. It's a bit striking that we actually see Shai Kelsop having more stories with the playing activity than the preschool teachers. And this got me thinking, why is that? How can that be? And this might have something to do with it. This is a, a, a quote from one of the preschool teachers relating the preschool to the school. In, in Sweden, the play is very, very important as a base for learning in preschool. So talking about this, I've used the school way of working rather than the preschool. Instead of transferring the preschool, it has become the opposite. And then the last sentence, maybe because I had have not had the right argument to advance preschool practice. This comes into what I call a professional blind spot, operating in professional development. The base is from the previous professional development the data I presented, where playing actually was a, one of the things that strike me as a big peculiar that the Shire Club staff had so many more stories about playing than the free school In 2010, 12, I think, we got the, me and my research group got the opportunity to do a huge professional development course, web based, which was meant to be for all preschool teachers in Sweden. So we have around 60% have been taking that course. It's one and a half year, and it's meant to be uh, that they work in groups at the preschools with this material. Uh, so I used that, uh, I followed three different preschools in their work with this, and I, for this, uh, research, I analyzed the parts about playing, the, where we discussed playing and where they had to present what they have done in the play part. Uh, this web-based material is, first they read a text and watch some films, uh, mostly films from preschools that we have videoed, uh, and then they, they discuss with their colleagues from questions that we have posed. After that, or at the end of that discussion, they start planning for something to do in their preschools with the children. They do that with their colleagues, uh, and we have provided examples and things. And then they go out and do things. With the children, it could be observing, or it could be a planned activity, or engaging in the children's free play or something like that. And the fourth part uh, is where they actually meet again and discuss what happened when they did this. So the data I have is from that fourth part, when they discuss what they have done with the children and how they looked at it. And I'm just focusing on playing. This whole web-based course has 12 parts, each having this four different loops, I can say. Uh, so, so they kind of get into working in this way. Playing is the second uh, part. The first one is an introduction to just giving them an overview of which of six mathematical activities. And they get to go out and actually see if they can see them themselves. We have provided videos from do you remember the first pictures I saw, show you? That's from our own videos. 
So we have already provided a look at videos where we have kind of said this is this and this. So now they're going out and look for it in the first part. The second part, they're going out and do something with play. We have also there provided what we suggest them to do. It could be like go and out and look at the children's free play and see if you can see play as a mathematical activity in that. Or engage in a game with the children or engage in a play situation or start a play situation by, for example, placing yourself in a box and saying this is a car or something like that. So this is what we have posted to them to do. Just going back so you remember what playing was about. So we have on the one side Bishop's view on playing as a mathematical activity, but we also have the Swedish preschool curriculum stating that play is important for the child's development and learning. And the conscious use of play to be promoted the development and learning of each individual child should always be presented in preschool activities. Play and enjoyment in learning in all its various forms stimulate the imagination, insight, communication, and the ability to think symbolically, as well as the ability to cooperate and solve problems. Through creative and gestural play, the child is given opportunity to express and work through his or her experience and feelings. So you can see some of the ways Bishop talks about it actually is present in the way the curriculum talks about play as the base for learning. For this is this is in the beginning of the curriculum where they actually says this is the way to work. This is the pedagogy we want you to work with. So my my hypothesis was that this student actually doesn't integrate very well. The child has thoughts that doesn't have an education, which means they probably hasn't been filled with playing as a pedagogy. Maybe that's the reason why they could notice play as a mathematical activity. That was the starting point. So when I, oh, this is the, I already told you about the web page one. You can see how it's done. So going back to the actual situation, this preschool teacher, she told this story. This is what she had done when she was, so she has uh, observed a free play situation. presented this story or this um, activity and talked about it as being mathematical due to the uh, modeling of a real world situation uh, by actually playing doctor you need a stethoscope and making sure that this was actually the rules for this play situation so the voice Actions didn't wasn't okay at first, but when he realized the rules, it was okay to join. Mm -hmm. So this is the way the preschool teacher talked about this. Uh, we have other stories uh, where they they seem to have done similar activities, so done something. But this is when I talk to them about. It's still in this whole group. That she has Gudrun has just presented her activity. So I asked her, did you think it was easy or hard to see the aspects of playing? Some things were easy, for example, counting, that is very easy, and designing. In order to try to get her to elaborate, they said, that's all, that's all the mathematical activity. What, but what aspects of playing as a mathematical activity did you see? 
So I thought of this, and she has presented a memory game. Yeah. Because in this, and that was a part of the story that that the boy had just done, but she didn't really uh, talk about as being part of this mathematical activity. He had talked about that boy and the hockey daycare. He has taken that from the reality and connected it to this box. There it was easy to see, but it was harder in this, and then she's pointing at the memory game. So I asked her then, because of the, the rule based in games, I would have thought that that was easy to see, that that's mathematical. So I asked her if she thought about the rules. Yes, yes, the rules. But I didn't think they talked that much about the rules when they played. So this is another example. And actually, I have many examples where they, when I talk about aspects of playing, they respond with the mathematical activities, all of them, or six of them, or a couple of them. Um, so this is, what I would say, uh, a problem with play as a mathematical activity and playing as the base for learning. Uh, after having done this, uh, I saw that the, the preschool teacher who had this, the story like the first one where they played doctor. Uh, they had observed uh, a play situation with no apparent mathematical content. Then they had no problem seeing the mathematics, mathematical features in that play situation. If it had, like for example, these bugs and things uh, and the memory, this situation had a mathematical content. And then it was hard for them to actually noticing uh, the feature of play as a mathematical activity. And I want to give you the opportunity to ask me questions. I know this was a quick overview over what I've done in the last years, but thank you very much for listening. Which is in between, 
preschool and, and school. Uh, that one doesn't have really a curriculum for it. So it's driving both up and down, or at least it should, which means some preschool class are working like in first grade, some preschool class are working like in preschool. So I think our problem is there. That's where we have the, the nut. Does this answer your question? Maybe it's a It's a really big question. So, yeah. <laughs> um, do you, well, do you have an example of what what someone from the the country would say, or how the school would report about these goals that we have? Like, what what would be something we would say in terms of an outcome to show that you were doing the school was doing? I just think maybe an example like that might give me a sense of how it works. Is so what I'm wondering. Is that you're wondering if they evaluate the school in any way? Yeah, you mean the preschool? Or? Yeah, because you said that the school has a goal of yeah. each student will. Mm -hmm. And so, is there a way that the school is assessed? Like, what what is the character of that? No, we we don't have that system okay. at okay. all. Okay. Uh, so there's no monitor. No. What the offers in relationship to those goals. Even though you have the national curriculum. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I'm wondering if you can say a little more about how you ended up at Bishop Six Categories instead of like any of the other kinds of things that one might use to consider early childhood. Starting reading about Bishop and having the feeling that this pre geometry pre doesn't fit. Uh, I was kind of looking for something that would fit, but also would fit, m uh, would, would fit my idea of mathematics. And I think that's a really big issue. How do we talk about mathematics? I mean, we say mathematics and expect everyone to be on the same page, but they're not. <laughs> really not. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was, I, I read Bishop and his, his book about this is a way that each, this is activities that is present themselves in each culture. So okay, if that's the way, then maybe that's the way the children also should get in contact with the mathematics. It felt like a starting point. Uh, from doing all this research and this professional development, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm sure about the categories and not saying them, but I'm not at all uh, satisfied with the naming of them. The naming says too much. Mm. It's too connected to other things to make it really good. Or con like play is connected to this idea of play as pedagogical. I mean, play has other. So, wider. Yeah. So like in our review, <laughs> the, the the definitions or meanings we bring to that word brings a problematic lens to looking at Bishop's framework. Yeah. Like designing, uh, people talk about that. That's not. Not being construction, for instance, because that doesn't belong to the design. <coughs> so I mean, there's different counting. Bishop's idea of counting is broader than what we actually mean by counting, yeah. which is one, two, three, four, five things. Uh, so uh, yeah, I have a problem with the name of them, but not the the content. Have you thought of other names? We we'll get that question a lot. <laughs> yes, I have. No, I don't have any <laughs> suggestions. I've thought about that a lot. And I mean, going to conferences and presenting this idea of actually using Bishop like we have done, uh, you get that discussion a lot. Is this really mathematics? So we also have to think about the, not just the wording, but also how we frame the entire all of the activities, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right, yeah. 
any word you might choose would be problematic. It would either be too narrow or too broad, or I mean, it's the unpacking of them. That's where the work yeah. is, and the examples that you bring in. Anyway. Yeah, I, I think that's the reason why I have a hard time finding other words, because every time I find someone, I end up, yeah, but then you get into that problem. Or that problem. So, so I like the content, mm -hmm. not the word. And I think, I think this is a good way just to start off of actually uh, putting the mathematics in preschool and showing off that this is important. Mm -hmm. And for the preschool teacher to feel comfortable in talking about mathematics. In Sweden, a lot of our preschool teacher, both in service and pre-service have this, oh, my, I'm bad at mathematics, I don't know it. And, and Bishop Six Mathematical Activities I have actually created for a lot of these preschool teachers a bridge to say, yes, I know this, and now we can talk about what we're doing in preschool as, as actually being mathematics. And that is one of my main goals, to actually find a way of getting them to feel that their work they do is valued for what it is. Hi, yes. Uh, so in working with the service teachers and helping them think about mathematics in this way, be able to recognize it in the early childhood classrooms and um, create environments that support this. I'm wondering how you think about the content and methods in classes for these teachers, because my experience here is that First of all, the U.S. does not have a national curriculum, so <laughs> the experience in different states is different. But like, we often teach a class that's aimed at, let's say, five-year-olds, ten-year-olds. Mm -hmm. But 80% of the mathematics in the course for those teachers is focused on mathematics for nine and ten-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And not on. so, I'm interested in both what you do to help develop this and the conversations you have with other mathematics educators convince them to give time in courses for the mathematics and that really can. Since we have this uh, preschool teacher program uh, on our university, it focuses on age one to five. So already there we have a <laughs> thing <laughs> <That'd be nice. laughs> Yeah, uh, and in this uh, three year program, they have whole semester of mathematics, which means we have the possibility of actually working with, and since this has gotten, be, gotten a great impact in Sweden this way, since it's the basis for the national curriculum and things, it's no problem to get my colleagues to be involved in. The problem has been to get everyone on kind of the same page. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by playing? What do we mean by, this is what Bishop said, can we make some terms in it or something? That's where we have the discussion. But I mean, so we're not facing the same problem as you do. We have a problem with the preschool class again, which actually the preschool class teachers either can take a preschool degree, preschool teacher degree, or a grade one to three degree, mm -hmm. and still work in preschool class. So that will be our problem. And that's Do you see a difference between teachers who are prepared in those two times? Yeah. Uh, since we have a more goal uh, curriculum for school, this is also about the teacher but you know, already in preschool class if they have had the one to three. So we, we can actually see that the preschool class becomes more school-like if it has teachers who been trained for one to three, then the other way around. I have two questions. Um, the first one, can you share some other um, good examples of playing that you've seen in high school? Mm -hmm. or, maybe playing, mm -hmm. or like playing, like, but yeah, mathematical playing. Good, I don't know if I good no. examples. Um, I guess maybe examples that preschool teachers have shared that 
that you felt um, lent themselves nicely to like mathematical development? I would say that most of the imaginative play situation, uh, like the one with the doctor or the one playing princess and playing, all of these are good play situations. And uh, also seen from a mathematical Due to the fact that they get to work with their hypothetical thinking, abstraction, modeling, and things like that. So finding a good, good mathematical play situation in preschool is easy. It's challenging the child in that work that is the hard part. And my second question was on um, since you mentioned that you also have a PhD in math, have you ever gotten a chance to talk about to mathematicians about mathematical development in preschool? And I'm curious about, if so, what their reactions are. <laughs> yeah, I've done that a couple of times, and I get mixed reactions. Um, it depends a bit on where I start. Uh, I, I noticed that. If I start with this is how I think of my own work as a mathematical researcher. I think the creativity and bringing out those parts, and then going from there into playing as a mathematical activity, then they're very positive. Okay, yeah, that's what they do in preschools. So if I start on the other side with playing as a mathematical activity and this is in preschool, then I get, that's not mathematics. So it, it's going to depend on how I, I phrase it. That's my experience. So I started using the other one, <laughs> going from myself. <laughs> this is how I see. Uh, and actually, one of our latest articles also starts at what is the work that mathematicians do? How can we frame this? How can we talk about it? And then comparing that to the mathematical. So I, I come from a science education background, and one, um, one example of pre, uh, preschool activity I was thinking about the other day, so, so one of my questions is, what are the boundaries around things that might be mathematically rich compared to others that might be less so? So for example, I, I can think of one in science that maybe there's an analogy to in that. So a typical preschool activity or early childhood activity um, asks students to mix colors together, but in very prescribed ways. So yellow and blue makes green. Ta-da, you see that yellow and blue makes green. So it makes these two, you know, mix, you know, red and and blue, they make purple. Ta-da, now you know. So this is this is often considered a science activity. And I don't think of this as very scientific at all, because the children are not really exploring, they don't really know that the, the world is about sort of seeing what colors might make other colors, and, and they don't really get the chance to do that. So um, so that analogy makes me think, are there, way, so are there ways in which a teacher might identify something as a mathematical activity that perhaps might only look like one, but not really be one? Yes. In, in a way that's productive, right, for kids. Yes, I, I think I think you're. So this is just the base to start off thinking about this. We're going to have all these different activities which matches mathematical activities in all these different levels of creativity. So one, some activities we would name as mathematical, while it's not really creativity involved or something. So I think we need to start thinking about to what extent do we challenge children in their mathematical activities. That feels for me a natural step from actually having based the mathematical activities and framed them. Now we need to talk about how we do it and challenge children within these mathematical activities and within these different situations. Was that a that 
that could be something that's common, but maybe not a mathematical activity because it's more like a list of words that go in a particular order, but they don't know that one means. But is that like necessary for the other to come? I don't really know. I don't they know. must learn the counting list in order to learn the counting. Yeah, so like that part is true. But I think what you see is that sort of thing goes on for much longer than is necessary. Okay. Children yeah. learn the counting list, but they continue to sing songs like that every day. Yeah, they're doing the whole thing. Can't stop the ten. <laughs> I have a question about differences in how students experience an environment that is more play-based with one that is school-based as a preschool experience. So like I think about taking my son to swim class, he's eight months, he gets a report card. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's Ooh, there's a, yeah, there's a difference. Wow. Like, <laughs> and I even think about learning, to, teaching him to eat solids. I could take the approach, which I have, and fail that, where I give him food and then I watch and see what he does. Like watching for behavior rather than we're eating and my husband and I are eating and I put some food there and then he starts eating, but we're not really attending to him eating. But he recognizes, oh, they're eating, so it's time for me to eat. It's, it's just different than like in cases where I take them to swim school and they give them a report card because they've been watching for particular behaviors. So I'm wondering though, it, it, I, I give that example as a way of, of leading to the question about like a play-based environment. Do you see differences in students' reactions and their sort of experience of it compared to environments where it does feel more like preparing them for school or kind of school-like activity? If I see a difference in, in the shyness or? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, they may not be able to verbally articulate it, but you might notice things in how they work with others. Or. Yeah, the only place we can look at that in Sweden is the preschool class. Uh, and the, what you get from the, the children who are in the play base is that they actually get a shock when they come to school. So, but they also have uh, an easier transaction into preschool class. But we haven't really looked into whether the play based or the more school like, what that makes the children think. Since this is just preschool class, uh, and that's a huge discussion in Sweden, what, how that's going to be like it's going to be school or preschool or where is it going to be. So we haven't actually done, or there hasn't been done almost any research in that particular class. There is longitudinal research in the US. I was going to say, I thought I saw something on a listserv about that, where they, they had two different kinds of interventions, one where they taught really explicit school stuff to very young children, and one where it was more sort of play-based and kids who had the really explicit school stuff even earlier burned out faster. Most of the research says you get a significant cognitive advantage doing explicit instruction in the short term. Mm -hmm. It fades out in one to two years. And interestingly, you get long-term negative behavioral effects from direct instruction in early childhood that persists through adulthood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I read that. <laughs> I mean, we only have, we should be going into preschool class in order to get that difference group. I have a specific question about the teachers and, the, and their examples of play. So, if I am interpreting the findings right, relatively, a relatively small percentage of the pre-service teachers or the teachers were giving examples of play on their own accord, right? Mm -hmm. um, did you, and this issue of whether it's just just play or mathematical play is, is, is a, it's hard to delineate between them. And I'm wondering, but when they when they gave examples of play, were they valid examples of play, or were there situations where teachers gave examples of, of play that maybe they thought was mathematical that you would say was not mathematical? If that makes sense, were all were were they good at differentiating between play that wasn't mathematical and play that was 
the Schalke stuff, yes. Uh, they talked about, when they gave example of play as mathematical activity, yes, I would say, I would agree with that. And when they talked about play, it was more like in the terms of baseball learning, and this is what we should be doing, and things like that. Uh, in the preschool teachers' stories, uh, the, the stories about mathematical play, Yes, I agree with the two I got, absolutely. But they also, in their, story, uh, their written papers, wrote about, uh, and it was hard to see whether or not they had actually distinguished between these two. Uh, so that's also one reason I was so interested in. Why do I get this from, when I had the other from the Shiny Cloud mm -hmm. where it was, more clear that they had actually distinguished between them. I could just ask you to talk about something that Jamie and I talked to you about. If, if you don't want to talk about it because of publishing that's in a broader audience, that's fine. But I think people here would be interested what you were talking about with the process standards and I'm uh, not process standards when you're talking about mathematical processes but because of what's going on here in the US about content versus mathematical processes I think if you wanted to talk a bit about that um, people would probably be interested in your thoughts <laughs> yeah give me a direction where to stop <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm so into, actually, and I think you can see that in the beginning of my talk, the division between the processes or the abilities and the content. Uh, and, and I think that's, I don't think it's important to divide these two. I think it's important to actually combine these two, but lift that the importance of the abilities or processes. At least in Sweden, uh, even the national curriculum for school has changed to be more about the processes and abilities, so we're going in that direction. But out in school, you can still see the focus on the content, really hard focus on the content, knowing the content is kind of what you measure still in school. So, it is important to, and I think it's not really recognized yet, not all over the research community of mathematics education, but those two parts actually have to be on the same level and weighted as much. But I think it may be even harder when documents like the Common Core are written and there's the content piece. They don't, um, some of the description of those don't actually fit some of the practices. Mm -hmm. There's like contradictions between how the content is written about, and into, like they don't match the 